of Isaiah, chapter 55. Keep Pastor and Sister Z in prayer. They're in Prince George this morning. Did a little trade-off in September. Brother Pilgrim came down and ministered. So now pastors are repaying the favor, and they were invited to come to Prince George to do a Sunday school program. So that's what they're doing this morning. Isaiah 55, we're going to begin reading there at verse number 1. It says, Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money, come ye, buy and eat. Yea, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Wherefore do you spend money for that which is not bread, and labor for that which satisfieth not? Hearken diligently unto me, and eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. Incline your ear, and come unto me, hear, and your soul shall live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. Behold, I have given him for a witness to the people, a leader and a commander to the people. Behold, thou shalt call a nation that thou knowest not, and nations that knew not thee shall run unto thee because of the Lord thy God, and for the Holy One of Israel, for he hath glorified thee. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Lord, we thank you for your presence in this house. We ask that you would bless each and every one in this place today as we open our ears to hear your voice and have a desire to feel you today, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Every day, almost every day, we make purchases in our lives. Some purchases that we make are easy purchases. There's not a little, lot of thought that goes into them. We, we go to the grocery store and we buy groceries. We put gas in our cars, or maybe we're just in a store somewhere and we see something, a, a trinket on a shelf or a little something that we think might be a nice gift for somebody else. And so without a whole lot of thought, we just go ahead and we buy it. We spend that money. And I know that today in our economy, things are changing. It's, we probably do spend a little bit more thought on the groceries that we buy and, and maybe the gas that we put in our car because of how expensive it is. But those are necessities. We can only go so long without having to purchase these things. You, can, you can't live your life without ever going and buying groceries. It's just it's an easy purchase to make. We'll, we'll sacrifice in other areas so that we can buy those things that we need. Those are easy things. But there are purchases in our lives that we might take a little bit of thought and put into them. You go into a store and you think, oh, I'd like to have that. And maybe while you think about it, maybe it's a new piece of furniture or stuff for your, for your kitchen. or It's not really something that you need. It's just something that you want. You think, well, this would make me happy for a little while, and I think I might like to buy that. But then as you sit and consider it, you begin to, but may we weigh the cost and you think, do I really need to have this? Am I going to have to sacrifice in an area of my need if I buy this? If I buy this stereo, am I going to have to cut back on the groceries for the next month or two because in order to be able to pay for this? And, and there are those decisions that we make that we maybe put a little bit more thought into those purchases and, and we, we begin to consider and weigh the cost. Is this really something that I need to have? Usually, we, a lot of times, if we're walking in the flesh, we, we answer the question, do I really need this? And the question is no. And then we think, is this really a smart purchase? And the answer is no. And is this purchase going to leave me short for my bills? And the answer is yes, but we go ahead and do it anyway, if you're walking in the flesh. And there are also those purchases that many people find stressful to have to make. Maybe it's a new car or a new home. Maybe you're at that point in your life where you're thinking, maybe I'd like to buy a business. And you set out making that decision and you set out working towards that purchase and you wake up in the middle of the night thinking, man, this is a commitment. 
man, is this really what I should be doing? Is, is this the right way to go? Is, am I doing the right thing? And you consider it and you stress about it. And you worry about it, wondering, am I making the right purchase? Because they're life altering commitments. But what I'd like to speak to you on this morning is your greatest purchase. We read in the beginning this morning in Isaiah chapter 55, verses 1 and 2 says, Ho, oh, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money, come ye, buy and eat. Yea, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. He goes on to say, Wherefore do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which satisfieth not? Hearken diligently unto me, and eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. So as Isaiah hears from God, he pens those words. The words that beckon to every single individual, to every single lost soul, come and buy. You don't need money for this purchase. Come and buy, and he will give to you. Come and buy and take that which the Lord has. He goes on to talk about we labor and we toil. We give many hours of our lifetimes for things that in the scope of eternity do not matter. We, we go through every one of those purchases that I listed off already. If we go, we go to the grocery store and we buy food, yes, we need food to eat. But do we need to buy steak? Do we need to eat hot dogs? Do we need whatever, whatever it is that we're buying? Is it really that big of a decision? Is it, does that really matter in the scope of eternity? If I want to go buy a new piece of furniture for my home, or if I want to go and buy new tires for my truck, or if I want to go buy a new, a new stereo to put in my living room, it doesn't matter in the scope of eternity. But yet we go to work every day and we earn money and we seek to be able to buy these things that for a moment might bring a little bit of happiness into our lives. But those things don't matter. We get to that place in our lives where maybe, maybe we rent a, a place to live and we think, oh, I'd like to own a house. I'd like to own some of these other things. And maybe we buy a house and then we get to that place in our lives and we think, well, maybe this house is too small and, and all my friends have got bigger homes and I want to sell this and I want to buy something bigger. And we strive and we work and we do overtime and we, we go to work every day pushing and struggling, trying to get ahead to get things that don't matter. All the while, God is saying, I've got a purchase for you that doesn't cost you any money. I've got something here that all you have to do is come. I've got something here that all you have to do is come and I'll give it to you freely. You don't have to toil for this. You don't have to struggle for this. You don't have to work every day to attain this. Because the things of this world, they will never satisfy. I know of a, a gentleman who has in the last probably six, seven years, has owned about four different houses because he buys one and they live in it for a little while and suddenly that's, this one's not quite what we want. So we go and we buy another one and they, they keep going more and more in debt. They keep going deeper and deeper into that realm and paying more and more for something. For what? So they can impress their friends. So they can impress people of this world because they're not satisfied. They could have stayed with the first one and it would have suited them just fine, but they weren't satisfied with it. We go to, to a, a new vehicle and then I want this kind of vehicle. And I want that kind of vehicle and it doesn't satisfy. I mean, maybe we go and buy a, a stereo and in that moment we feel good and it doesn't satisfy. And we go and spend money for things that in the moment maybe quenches that thirst, but then it goes away. It brings pleasure for a season, but it doesn't last. Isaiah goes to say, goes on to say in Isaiah 55 and verse 3 says, Incline your ear and come unto me. Hear, and your soul shall live. And I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. Just open your ears. Hear that voice as he says, Come to me. 
As he says, come, it's not going to cost you anything. You just have to come. You just have to have that willingness to open your ears. You have to have that willingness to open your heart and let him in. Let him into that inside place. And it's for your soul. Your soul shall live. The invitation is there. Come and buy. You don't need money. But what exactly are you buying? What can you buy without money? Proverbs 23 and 23 says, buy the truth and sell it not. Also wisdom, instruction, and understanding. Buy the truth. The truth is what's going to satisfy you. We've got the scripture here. John 8.32 says, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. It'll set you free from the things of this world. It'll set you free from the things that aren't going to satisfy, because people may not realize it, but they are bound sometimes by trying to fulfill that worldly pleasure, that worldly lust that is inside of them, that thing that's going to give you happiness for a moment that doesn't last. And so they go and they buy something. And in that moment, they think, oh, I'm happy, but it goes away. And then they right away, they're back looking, what can I buy over here? And I need that I go and I search for this and I'll buy this and I'll go after this, but it doesn't satisfy. And they keep looking and searching for that, that they can buy. And I, even in the term buy, it's in events that we do. You take a young child and you say, oh, you do, what do you want to do? Do you want to do piano lessons? Oh, I want to do piano lessons, and they'll do that for a little while. And then it's like, oh, I want to go into dancing, and they go and do that for a little while. Oh, maybe I want to go and do baseball, and they'll do that for a little while. But those things are not satisfying that thing inside. As the song that we sang this morning, that Sunday school song, Life Without Jesus is like a donut because there's a hole in the middle of your heart. There's that thing that you're trying to satisfy on the inside, and all of these things that we go after, that we toil for, and that we search for, they'll never satisfy. But he's beckoning, saying, come and buy without money. Come and taste and see, and he will satisfy that longing that's inside your soul. So we're to buy that truth and never let it go. Don't sell it. Come and buy it, take it, and keep it for yourself. You see, there are many people out there today that are peddling a counterfeit religion. They're trying to sell you that are, uh, this cheap knockoff. Something that they're going to tickle your ears, make you feel good for a moment. They'll tell you that the way you're living is okay. Just keep on going. Just but come in and give us your tithe. Come in and, and come and fill the seats. It's not about having a church that's full of a thousand people that are all going to the same rotten eternity. It's about having a church full of people that love God. It's about having a church full of people that are seeking after God, that are opening their ears to God and allowing God to change their lives. So I'm not trying to sell you on a counterfeit. I'm not trying to sell you an imitation. I'm not even trying to sell you on religion. What I'm trying to sell you on today, the thing that I would like you to buy today, is a relationship with Jesus Christ. Come in and say, God, I want to know you. I want to seek after you. I, des I desire to have you in a part of my life. And that's all he's beckoning for from you today. That's all he's trying to say when he says, come and buy. He's saying, come and buy that relationship with me. Come and give your life to me, and I will give this back to you. Because it will be your greatest purchase. It's going to be that thing that's going to satisfy you when you go and lay your head down at night. When the cares of this world start to become overwhelming and you put your head down and you can have that peace that only comes through Jesus Christ. And he takes the worry away and he takes everything away because you can say, I'm just going to trust in him. Because he sees my tomorrow. He sees where I'm going. He sees where I've been. He sees what I've done. As I said at the beginning, during our songs, that we can look and we can see a nice suit and we can see a nice tie and think, oh, yeah, and he, but he, Brother Holland doesn't have a clue what I've gone through in my life. He doesn't know what I've experienced in my life. I was 30 years old before I came to God. I've experienced a lot of things before I came to God, and I didn't look like this. I didn't dress like this. I didn't act like I act now. But God got a hold of me. 
But I came to a place where I said, I want to buy that. I want to buy that peace. I want to buy that joy. I want to buy that relationship with God, but it doesn't cost me any money. I was able to come in freely and say, God, I just want to know you. I want to be able to put my trust in you. I want to have my faith in you. And all along the way, he has been there for me. That was the greatest purchase that I could ever make in my life. We can turn our Bibles to Matthew chapter 25. More than ever, I believe that this parable comes to play. Because we make a choice every single day of what we're going to do. Matthew 25, beginning at verse number 1, says, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. And while the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go you out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you, but go you rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. You see, five of those virgins were wise. They were prepared. They purchased oil for their lamps. They were waiting for their Lord to come back. They had been warned that the bridegroom would come for them, and they were just told to be ready. Just like we preach to you that we need to be ready. They made that purchase and were prepared for the time. And they walked through the door. And it closed behind them. Now I read this story. And it says, And the bridegroom came. They that were ready went in with him to the marriage. And the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgin, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. Well, those five wise virgins had walked through the door. The door closed behind them. Now, were they there? Lord, open to us. Lord, let us in. Lord, you called for us, and we're back. We went and we bought that oil. We're ready now, God. Were they on the inside listening to the pounding on the outside, listening to the cry of the five foolish, listening to the cry of the lost as they stood outside of that door saying, open, let us in? Were they in that moment saying, I'm so glad that I made that purchase? I'm so glad that I was ready. I'm so glad because that was the greatest purchase of my life. They listened as the Lord turned to that door. Speaking through it, saying, I don't know you. So grateful that they realized that knowing the bridegroom, preparing for his return, being ready for that call, and having oil in their lamps was their greatest purchase. I don't want to be there on that day. Bible says that the days are going to be as they were in the days of Noah. Marrying, giving, and marrying in marriage, eating, drinking, partying, having fun. Bible also tells us that Noah built the ark. 
All the animals came. They all went into the ark. And then it began to rain. And the Lord closed the door on that ark. Noah wasn't there pulling on a pulley system, pulling that door shut. He wasn't there um, holding the door just a little bit longer, hoping that somebody would come in. In that moment, God closed the door. And I imagine, in my great imagination, as that door began to close, and as the rains were coming down, as the waters were coming up, and the people that were there mocking Noah in that day, they were mocking what it was that he was doing, mocking the fact that he was telling them they needed to be ready. They needed to prepare because he was doing what God had asked him to do. God said, I want you to build the ark because I'm going to destroy this world with water. I'm going to flood the world. And so he was doing as he was told. I can't imagine Noah being a righteous preacher that he would have spent his time not reaching for those around him not telling them that they needed to be ready, not telling them that they needed to prepare for the rains that were going to come. And they would have scoffed at him and they would have mocked him because they didn't know what rain was. But then as the waters began to come down and the Bible says that the, even the floods of the deep opened up, the tides started coming in. Now water started rising up and it's getting up to their ankles and then it's getting up to their knees. And now they're wading through this water going, Noah was right. And here it comes. And as they go and they start clawing at the side of the ark, saying, Noah, let us in. Open the door to us, Noah. We're ready now. It's the same as the five foolish virgins standing outside of that door saying, let us in. I want to be ready. I want to be ready with oil in my lamp. I want to be ready waiting for the, my Lord to come, waiting for him to call me home, waiting for that day, not being caught unaware. Matthew chapter 13, starting at verse number 44, says again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field. The which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth the field. Verse 45 says, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had, and he bought it. When you find that something, that thing that you've been searching for, even longing for, that thing that's going to truly satisfy that hole on the inside, that thing that's going to bring you peace every night when you go to bed, the thing that's going to bring you joy when you get up every morning. That should be worth selling everything that you have and going and buying it, going and, and taking of it. You're going to do whatever it takes to be able to possess that. When you get to that place where you have to have something, nothing's going to stop you. You're going to find a way. If you work a job, you need a place to live, and you say, I want to buy a home. You're going to buy a home. You're going to sacrifice in every other area of your life to be able to get that. If that's what you've got in your heart, that's what you've set your mind on, and I have to do this thing, you're going to do it. Some way or another, you're going to find a way. Why is having a relationship with God not that way? Why is knowing Jesus not that way in our lives? Because he should be everything. He should be our all. He should be that goodly pearl. He should be that treasure hid in the field. He should be that thing that we should seek after and desire to have every single day. That we're not going to let our daily lives, we're not going to let our work lives interfere with what God wants to do in our lives. We're not going to let what others around us say about our lives. We're going to search for it and seek after it. That it doesn't matter what our friends say when they might mock us when we cha start changing our lives to live for God. They're going to they may not understand, but we're going to say, I don't care about them. 
Because it's about my relationship with Jesus Christ, and that's all that matters in my life. The world doesn't, they don't understand they, that we don't run to the same excess of riot that they do, that they don't understand the reason why we don't live our lives the way that they do, but it's because they don't understand that relationship. They don't re understand that we have found that thing that satisfies our soul. They don't realize that we found that thing that means everything in the world to us. Because I've been there. I've tasted of the things of this world. I've drank what this world had to offer. I've gone all the different ways of the world, and they never satisfied. If we look at just the fact of spending money, just look at impulse shoppers. Spending money releases chemicals and hormones that make you feel happy for a while. If you look and you search out these people that have addictions to spending money, spending compulsion must always be fed. And people will go out and buy and buy and buy and buy, but they're never satisfied. They don't ever figure out that there's that it's never going to satisfy them. See, after making a purchase, you feel pretty good for a short time. But then that high, those endorphins fade off and it doesn't last. And when it wears off, you're left with shame and guilt. And then you get buyer's remorse. Maybe we know that we should have spent our money and putting it into an emergency fund or paid down high interest credit cards or paid off a debt somewhere, but we choose to flood our brains with those feel-good chemicals instead. We, try, we, we thrive on those endorphins. We thrive on what that does in our lives, and we keep going, and we keep going, and we keep going, because it's, but it always fades away. It always goes away. That's why I'm trying to sell you on a relationship with Jesus and why this is your greatest purchase. Because a relationship with Jesus is guilt-free. You come in and you experience the power of the Holy Ghost. That, that feeling doesn't fade away and leave you with guilt and shame. That feeling that you feel in the power of the Holy Ghost, it might fade away, but all it does is creates a longing for more of it. But you don't feel guilty for experiencing it. You don't feel shame for allowing God into your life. That you do after drinking from a bottle. That you do after looking at internet sites that you shouldn't be looking at. That you don't get from smoking a joint. And the feeling that comes afterwards when you think, I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have gone there. I shouldn't have allowed that into my life. I don't know anybody that's ever had a relationship with Jesus that, uh, that after a while said, oh, I wish, really wish I didn't have this. Because they feel way better than they've ever felt in their lives. Your life isn't going to be problem three, but he's going to help you through your problems. He's going to walk beside you. He's going to be there for you. And you can trust in him. 1 Peter chapter 1. Beginning at verse number three. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, to inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations. That the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen you love, and whom, though now you see him not, Yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. That's what you get to look forward to in knowing him. The greatest purchase you could ever make is to know him. The greatest thing would be to give your life 
to know him. The man who I was needs to die. And I need to rise up in that newness of life and live for God. Because the things of this world will perish and they will fade. All that your flesh desires to purchase will be corrupted. But that thing that you can purchase without money will never fade and never be corrupted. And in fact, it becomes more precious every single day. It's the greatest investment you can make. People spend money. Nowadays, it's cryptocurrency, and they'll, they'll buy it and hoping that it's going to go up in value. They'll invest their money in stocks and different things, hoping that for that big windfall one day, that one day they're going to strike it big. Then the markets crash and they commit suicide because they've lost everything. But you invest in Jesus Christ, more precious than gold and silver. It's only going to grow more and more precious every day. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 1. It says, wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby, if so be you have tasted that the Lord is gracious, to whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. He also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house, and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable by God, acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, behold, I lay in Sion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you therefore which believe he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same as made the head of the corner and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto they also were appointed. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Chosen of God and precious. From the realization of what Jesus gave for you and I. You see, salvation has a great cost. But Jesus paid the price. That's why he says, come and buy without money. He says, come and buy because I've already paid the bill. Come and taste and see. The price that we could not pay. The price of sin in our lives, the, the, the bill that was coming for each and every one of us, we could never have paid that price. But God came to this earth in the form of man. Just like what Abraham told Isaac when he was taking Isaac up onto the mountain and Abraham was going to sacrifice him as the Lord had asked. And Isaac turns around and he starts looking around and he says, Dad, you know, we've got the firewood and we've got all the stuff that we need, but we don't have a sacrifice. Unknowing that for all intents and purposes, he was going to be the sacrifice. And Abraham turns to Isaac. He says, the Lord will provide himself a sacrifice. Foretelling the coming of Jesus Christ, who would, as God provided himself as a sacrifice for you and I. Paying the price that we could not pay to offer us the greatest purchase in the world. 
without money. You just have to come. As he calls your name, as he beckons to your soul, today he offers you salvation that you can purchase without money. And this, my friend, is a part of your greatest purchase. He is calling for you today. Isaiah, back to Isaiah 55 and 1. The middle part says, Come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money, come ye, buy and eat. So how can you make this purchase? As we stand together this morning, Sister Wilson comes. Purchase is easy. There's no credit check involved. No 50-page contract for you to sign. You don't have to look at the small print. It costs you nothing. All you have to do is come to him. Acknowledge your bankrupt condition. And seek the gift of forgiveness through repentance. The only thing that it's going to cost you is your surrender. Today, if you're thirsting, today, if you're hungry, you're hungering for the things that this world cannot provide. I say, come and give your life as your greatest purchase. I open this altar today. God is here right now, and he's reaching for you. All you need to do is just lift up your hands and say, God, I want to let you in. And open your heart and let God move in you. Let that be your greatest purchase today. Lord, I thank you, Jesus.